Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the Illumina DNA Prep and Tagmentation Library Preparation Kit. This webinar is meant to be an introduction to this kit, so this presentation will be for customers who are just getting started, rather than those who have been running this library prep workflow on a regular basis. Before we start, I would like first to discuss a name change associated with this product. Illumina DNA Prep and Tagmentation is the new name for the Nextera DNA Flex Kit. So, if you've previously used the Nextera DNA Flex Kit, this webinar is about the same product, but with a new name. The M refers to the medium insert size compared to other kits, and Tagmentation refers to the method of input fragmentation. Please note that some of our published documents, such as app notes or data sheets, still use the Nextera DNA Flex name. Again, Illumina DNA Prep and Tagmentation and Nextera DNA Flex both refer to the exact same product. Some associated index kits have also been renamed, and we will discuss this later in the webinar. For the library prep kit, the protocol has not changed whatsoever. The catalog numbers and reagent compositions have not changed either. Only the name has changed. I also wanted to make a note that the name of this kit is very similar to the Illumina DNA Prep S tagmentation kit, which is part of our Illumina DNA Prep with enrichment kit. This is a separate enrichment workflow that will not be discussed in today's webinar. Now, let's get started with the presentation by first answering that question, what is Illumina DNA Prep and Tagmentation? Illumina DNA Prep is a library preparation kit that, offer, that offers flexibility for many whole genome sequencing applications. One popular application is for human whole genome sequencing, as you can see there. However, the kit is also compatible with genomic DNA from non-human species, including large or complex animal or plant genomes. This opens up applications such as agrigenomics or sequencing with your favorite model organisms, like Drosophila or mice. Additionally, this kit is compatible with small genomes too. So it's useful for metagenomics, or public health research and surveillance applications. Illumina DNA Prep also has the flexibility to accommodate variations in sample type, DNA input amount, and applications. Later in the presentation, we will discuss alternative types of input that can be used beyond genomic DNA. I also wanted to mention that Illumina DNA Prep is one of the fastest Illumina library preparation workflows with a total prep time of under four hours. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, this kit has optimized library prep performance and will therefore generate reliable results. Okay, here's the outline of today's webinar. First, we will discuss the advantages of using the Illumina DNA Prep Kit. We will then talk about the consumables and equipment needed for library prep. We will go into input recommendations, the library prep workflow itself, library quality control. We will also discuss about sequencing considerations, and we will delve into the optional blood, saliva, and bacteria workflows. First, let's discuss the advantages of using this prep kit. As you can see on this slide, Illumina DNA Prep has improved coverage uniformity as compared to previous fragmentation-based kits. This kit utilizes enzymatic fragmentation instead of mechanical shearing, which is used in our TrueSeq kits. This is useful and very convenient for labs that don't have access to a covaris for mechanical shearing. In this graph, we see a comparison of human genome coverage with Illumina DNA prep. 
which uses enzymatic fragmentation, and also of TrueSeq DNA Nano, which uses mechanical fragmentation with Covaris. As you can see there, the coverage between these two is very comparable. Illumina DNA Prep has also been optimized to work well with low and high GC content genomes. On the left is an organism that has low GC content, and on the right is an organism that has high GC content. As you can see there, we can see an improved coverage over previous versions of fragmentation-based kits, such as Nextera XT. This is especially helpful and useful for metagenomic sequencing applications, where we may be dealing with a range of microorganisms with variations in terms of GC content. These figures can be found in our Illumina DNA PrEP datasheet, and you can find the link, the link at the bottom of this slide. Illumina DNA PrEP is also compatible with a wide range of DNA input quantities. If you're familiar with our Nextera XT kit, you may know that the input requirement is exactly one nanogram. For Illumina DNA PrEP, though, you have more flexibility with the input. Here you can see that we have validated input ranging from one to 500 nanograms. And this graph shows the insert sizes with varying amounts of DNA input on the x-axis. The insert size on the y-axis is very comparable between one nanogram input and 500 nanogram input. Another nice feature of this kit is that if we start with between 100 and 500 nanograms of DNA input, the library yield will be normalized. Here on the y-axis is the yield in nanograms per microliter, and you can see that the yields are very comparable when we use an input, in, an input ranging between 100 and 500 nanograms. This normalization of library yield is also expected if we use the lysis protocols for liquid blood or saliva, or the demonstrated protocols for dried blood spots and microbial colony extraction. We expect these alternate protocols to generate enough starting input DNA to allow for library normalization. Of course, we will be discussing these alternate protocols later in the presentation. In this slide, I will be comparing Illumina DNA Prep with our older Nextera XT kit, which is still available. In terms of the type of input, Nextera XT is only compatible with small genomes, while Illumina DNA Prep is compatible with both small and large genomes. As discussed in a previous slide, Illumina DNA Prep is compatible with 1 to 500 nanograms of DNA input. Although, for large genomes, we do recommend at least 100 nanograms of input. With Nexter XT, we require exactly one nanogram. No more and no less. So Illumina DNA Prep is definitely more flexible. Another difference is in the tagmentation reaction. With our tagmentation-based kits, double-stranded DNA is enzymatically fragmented with a transposome. With Illumina DNA Prep, the tagmentation reaction occurs on beads, while with Nextera XT, the enzymatic reaction occurs in solution, as you can see on that slide. The next difference is with PCR. With Illumina DNA Prep, since we start with a small and viable amount of DNA, we will have a viable cycle numbers based on the input quantity. With Nextera XT, on the other hand, because we have a fixed, uh, fixed input, we will have a fixed number of cycles. The final difference in the protocol is with the post-amplification bead cleanup step. Illumina DNA Prep uses a double-sided size selection, which results in a more narrow library size distribution. Nextera XT, on the other hand, uses one-sided size selection and consequently, Nextera XT libraries are broader in terms of fragment distribution. You also have to keep in mind that the narrower size distribution of Illumina DNA Prep makes it easier to optimize loading concentration for sequencing. <laughs> 
Next, let's now talk about the consumables and equipment that are needed before starting library prep. There are three categories of products needed for Illumina DNA prep. The first one being the optional Flex Lysis reagent kit. This is only required if you plan on using blood samples directly with the kit. It cannot be used with other types of input, only with blood. Next, we have the Illumina DNA prep and fragmentation library prep reagents, which are required for this workflow, obviously. <laughs> These reagents come in either a 24 sample or 96 sample format. Please note that the required index kits are purchased separately from the library prep reagents, and this will allow you for more choices in indexing. There are several indexing options. The first one are with using the combinatorial dual or CD indexes, which come in a 24 sample or 96 sample format. We also have the option of using unique dual indexes or UD indexes with the Illumina DNA prep kit. So, what is the difference between CD and UD index kits? With CD indexes, index combinations can share either an I5 or an I7 sequence, even though the index combinations will be unique for each sample. With UD indexes, index combinations have unrelated index sequences for both I5 and I7. To illustrate, with combinatorial indexes on the left, when we go across the plate, we will have repeated I7 indexes across each row and repeated I5 indexes down each column. However, looking at the final library index colors below the plate, we can see that even though some indexes are repeated, that would be green in this case, each combination of indexes on the plate is unique. On the right is an illustration of UD indexing. In this setup, there are no redundancies whatsoever in the I5 or the I7 sequences in the entire plate. Each I5 is unique, and each I7 is unique too. Unique dual indexing is especially useful in mitigating possible index misassignment from index hopping. With UD indexes, any index hopped reads will be bioinformatically removed. Here, I listed four unique dual index kits available for Illumina DNA prep. Each set has 96 single-use wells with premixed I5 and I7 indexes. All four index sets could be combined on a run for up to 384 uniquely indexed samples. Here, I do want to note a name change for these indexes too. Sets A and B have changed from Nextera DNA unique dual indexes to IDT for Illumina DNA slash RNA UD indexes. The catalog numbers and the indexes remain the same though. The names of sets C and D have not yet changed because later this year, we are planning on releasing version two of these kits. For version two, the sequences of several indexes will change. And all these indexes can be found on the Illumina DNA prep product page. Of course, the index sequences can also be found in our adapter sequences document that I linked here. Okay. Now that we have our reagents, let's ensure that we have all the equipment and consumables that we need. In terms of equipment, we would need a micro centrifuge, MIDI plates, a magnetic stand, which is compatible with 96 well MIDI plates, of course, a vortexer, and a thermocycler. If you are using the blood or saliva sample workflows, these are potential biohazards. And for these workflows, we will need a water bath, 
and an additional thermocycler, which should be located in a BSL-2 lab or cabinet. For more specifics on consumables and equipment needed, consumable suppliers or part numbers, for instance, please see pages 27 to 29 of the linked reference guide. While we're on the topic of reagents, I also would like to mention one more thing before we move on with the presentation. Illumina DNA prep is typically used for whole genome sequencing and has not been validated for the attack seek method. attack seek is a popular method for profiling accessible chromatin, and it uses fragmentation reagents from the discontinued Nextera DNA kit not Nextera DNA Flex kit. If you're working with the Nextera DNA fragmentation enzyme and buffer or custom application such as Ataxic, please do not substitute Illumina DNA prep reagents as they have not been tested for these applications. Instead, you may want to use the Tagment DNA TDE1 enzyme and buffer kits. The catalog numbers for the large and small kits are shown below. Okay, now that we know how to get the correct equipment and consumables, let's go over input recommendations for Illumina DNA prep libraries. As discussed earlier, Illumina DNA prep supports a variety of sample input types. Apart from genomic DNA, this protocol is also compatible with cDNA samples, plasmids, or PCR amplicons greater than 150 base pairs in size. Input DNA needs to be double-stranded to be compatible with the fragmentation process. We can also use direct input from blood and saliva, as I mentioned several times already, using the supplemental procedures at the end of the protocol. We also have demonstrated protocols available to use inputs directly from microbial colonies or dried blood spots. And these protocols are linked here. If we are working with a small genome, including most bacteria or even plasmids and PCR implicants, we can use anywhere between one and 500 nanograms. But if we are working with large genomes, which generally include eukaryotic genomes or genomes greater than five megabases, we recommend at least 100 nanograms. This larger input amount is needed to capture the complexity of larger genomes. Even though Illumina DNA prep provides a large range of flexibility of input sample types and DNA input quantities. It is important to note that users still need to know generally how much DNA we are putting into the assay. If we have an input that is known to be between 1 and 100 nanograms, quantification with a fluorometric assay such as qubit or picogreen is required in order to determine the number of PCR cycles later in the prep. If we know that our input is somewhere between 100 and 500 nanograms though, accurate quantification is not strictly required. An advantage of Illumina DNA prep from previous segmentation based kits is that it is less sensitive to the accuracy of input quantification in this range. Looking at the table below, we can see that the number of PCR cycles required is variable between 1 and 100 nanograms, as I said before. However, once we reach 100 nanogram, we will always use 5 PCR cycles. I would also like to emphasize that if we start with at least 100 nanograms of input, we expect a normalized library yield. In order to have a normalized library yield from fresh blood or saliva, we will need to use the fully integrated blood and saliva lysis protocols in the supplemental methods. We also recommend qualifying 
the input using a UV-based method, like NanoDrop, to determine if the 260 over 280 and 260 over 230 ratios are within our recommended ranges. Ratios outside these ranges may indicate contamination. And contaminants in the input may, in, may inhibit library prep. On this slide, I have provided a link to a bulletin describing these possible contaminants. Additionally, Illumina DNA prep is optimized for high quality input and use of fragmented or degraded DNA, for instance, may lower overall library yield. If you're planning on using degraded input, please reach out to us in tech support. Okay, now that we have the correct type of DNA input and the correct quantity, we can start, finally, the library preparation itself. Here is an overview of the library prep workflow. And we will discuss this in more details over the next few slides. We will start the protocol either with genomic DNA or alternate inputs such as cDNA, plasmids, or amplicons, as discussed before. But we can also start with the optional direct blood lysis or saliva lysis workflows. We will talk more about those two lysis protocols later, but once we have lysed the, the sample or diluted our DNA, the workflows will be the same from this point on. The DNA from this first step will be enzymatically fragmented or fragmented into smaller pieces. After fragmentation, the fragments will be cleaned up. This will be followed by an amplification step, which increases library yield and also adds index adapters by PCR. After this, we will clean up the libraries to narrow the size distribution, as discussed before. And finally, we will pull the libraries for sequencing. On this workflow, validated safe stopping points are indicated on this slide and also in the reference guide. If there is no safe stopping point at a certain step, we recommend continuing with the workflow immediately. These safe stopping points are something to keep in mind when you're planning the timing of your experiment. OK, let's now talk about the first step in greater depth, tagment genomic DNA. When we talk about fragmentation, we mean that the DNA will be both enzymatically fragmented, but will also be tagged in a single step. As discussed earlier, something new about Illumina DNA prep is that the fragmentation step occurs with bead linked transposomes, or BLTs, rather than with free transposomes in solution. Here we see that the transposome enzymes in yellow are attached to the beads. The genomic DNA will be captured by the transposomes and it will be enzymatically fragmented and also tagged with the partial adapter sequences represented here in blue and green. This step happens on a thermocycler for 15 minutes at 55 degrees Celsius. <laughs> It's a very quick step. Here, we can also see why higher input is normalized with bead link transposomes. After a certain input quantity, the beads become saturated with DNA, and any additional DNA will be washed away. Now, let's talk about a few best practices for handling bead link transposomes, or BLTs. BLTs are magnetic beads, and these have to be stored between 2 and 4 degrees Celsius. We need to ensure that the beads are not frozen. If we do accidentally freeze those beads, the efficacy will be greatly reduced. We also want to ensure that we vortex the beads to fully resuspend them before use, 
Centrifugation is not recommended before pipetting. However, once the beads are in the sample, we can briefly centrifuge the plate if the beads stick to the sides or to the top of the plate. In this next step, we will be moving on uh, to the post-augmentation cleanup. Here, we will be adding the tagment stop buffer to neutralize the enzyme and stop the tagmentation process. Then, we will perform two rounds of wash steps with the tagment wash buffer, or TWB, to clean up the adapted tag DNA prior to amplification. Please note that the TWB contains a detergent that can generate foam when pipetting. So at this step, we want to use a gentle pipetting technique with the TWB in order to minimize foaming. Pipetting too quickly may cause foaming and some sample loss. After the washes, we will incubate the sample on the magnetic stand to form a pellet with the magnetic bead link transposomes. Be sure to also keep the pellet in the wash buffer until the next step, the next step to avoid drying out the pellet. After cleanup, we will be moving on to the PCR amplification step. This step amplifies the tagmented DNA using a limited cycle PCR program. And this step uses the enhanced PCR mix, or EPM, which is a master mix alongside with index adapters. As we discussed earlier, the index adapter kit needs to be purchased separately. And there are several index options that I mentioned before. During the PCR amplification step, the I5 and I7 index adapters will prime of the partial adapter sequences that were added during the tagmentation uh, step. This will result in libraries with the complete final library sequence that will be compatible with all Illumina sequencers. Illumina has a list of validated thermocyclers in the reference guide. Coverage of GC-rich regions can be impacted by the model, settings, and performance of the thermocycler used. Something to pay attention to is that the number of PCR cycles is determined by the amount of input, as discussed previously. The more input we use, the fewer PCR cycles are necessary. On this step, we also want to ensure that all the tagment wash buffer has been completely removed from the samples before adding the PCR master mix. This is because the TWB can inhibit the PCR reaction, and this will lead to a lower yield in this case. Some best practices when handling index adapters can be found on this slide. When we are handling index tubes, be sure to only add one index tube at a time, and this to avoid contamination. Index kits that come with tubes include replacement caps too. So be sure to replace with a fresh cap after opening each tube, and this to minimize contamination. Also, we would want to remove unused index adapter tubes from the work area. If we are working with index plates, though, those can be combinatorial or unique dual indexes, please be aware that each well is for single use only, even though each well includes some volume overage. This is, again, to avoid contamination. These plates are sealed, so we will need to puncture the foil seal before use and we would want to store a used index plate with a new foil seal as well. After PCR, we are going to clean up the amplified DNA using a double-sided bead size selection. Bead cleanup generally involves binding DNA to the beads, washing the beads, 
then eluding the DNA back into solution. For the bind step, we will be adding sample purification beads to the MIDI plate. In this step, we will be using a larger volume, which is why we need a larger plate. We will either pipe at to mix or use a plate shaker, then we will incubate the plate on a magnetic stand. For the wash steps, we will bind the beads to the magnetic stand, add fresh 80% ethanol, and ensure that we do not disturb the pellet whatsoever. For the LU step, we will remove the ethanol, add a suspension buffer, RSB, and LU the DNA from the beads. Let's now take a closer look at this double-sided size selection in the cleanup step. The first size selection step removes large fragments. In this step, the large fragments in blue are bound to the beads and discarded. Our desired library fragments remain in the supernatant in this case, which is then taken through the second size selection step. In this second size selection step, we remove smaller fragments here in orange. Our desired library fragments are then bound to the beads. The supernatant, which contains unwanted small fragments, is discarded. The bead containing our library is then washed, and the library is then eluded with RSB. This double-sided cleanup results in a library with a narrow size range, shown here as the red trace. And this double-sided bead selection uh, is applicable if we are working with larger inputs, including any type of large DNA, large DNA genomic DNA, cDNA, or amplicons that are greater than 500 base pairs. In the case we were using amplicons smaller than that, so smaller than 500 base pairs, we have a modified cleanup protocol. In this case, we will perform just a single-sided bead cleanup with a 1.8x bead over sample ratio. This means that any fragments below 100 base pairs are in the supernatants. The library remains on the beads, which we keep in this case, and we discard the supernatant with the small fragments. Since the starting input is smaller in this case, this modified cleanup step ensures that we only remove the smallest fragments and retain as much of the library yield as possible. Okay, we will now go over a few best practices for SPB handling. As I told you before, SPB stands for sample purification beads. And this step is critical to ensure that we have a good library yield and the desired library size. Just like bead link transposomes, the sample purification beads are magnetic and they should never be frozen. We want to bring the sample purification beads to room temp before use for at least 30 minutes, as indicated on this slide. It's also important to ensure that we are always using freshly prepared 80% ethanol for the washes, as ethanol is hygroscopic and evaporates over time. In terms of handling, we want to ensure that we vortex the beads until well resuspended and we should use the recommended plates and magnetic stand as per the reference guide. Also, we want to pipe it up and down carefully to minimize foaming, as we said before. When drying the beads, please allow the plate to remain on the magnetic stand to prevent potential bead loss. So, at this point, we have completed all library preparation steps, and we have our final libraries. We want to move on to sequencing as soon as possible from this step. But first, we want to check our libraries to ensure that they look as expected and this before sequencing, 
the library QC step is listed as optional in the reference guide. But we would highly recommend performing this QC step if possible. Sequencing can be costly and time consuming, as you may know. And we want to find any potential problems before sequencing. Performing this QC step is especially important if this is the first time you have prepared these libraries, for instance, or if you are using a new sample type. We recommend checking the library size by running the final libraries on a bioanalyzer or a fragment analyzer chip. Shown below um, are a few examples of what we may expect the traces to look like. We expect an average library size of around 600 base pairs, which corresponds to an insert size of roughly 450 base pairs. However, keep in mind that because shorter fragments cluster more efficiently than large ones, the observed average insert size in downstream analysis will be around 350 base pairs. It is also normal uh, to, to observe the size ranging uh, between 150 base pairs to around 1,500 base pairs. Note that the slight shoulder around 1,000 and 3,000 base pairs uh, is sometimes observed on these traces. The appearance of this peak can vary between DNA samples and does not affect downstream sequencing whatsoever. If you are concerned about your library size or if something looks unusual on those QC traces, please feel free to call us in technical support or email a PDF of your traces to techsupport at illumina.com for further review. The bioanalyzer or fragment analyzer lets us look at the size and shape of the library to assess quality. For quantification, though, if we started with 1, one to 100 nanograms of DNA input, we recommend quantifying individual libraries with a fluorometric quantification method, such as qubit or picogreen, as indicated on this slide. In this case, we will manually normalize the libraries to the same starting concentration. For 100 to 500 nanograms of input, or if using the blood slash saliva lysis workflows, individual libraries quantification may not be required. This is because the library yield will be already normalized on the beads. For optimal cluster density, if we started with 100 to 500 nanograms of input, we can pull five microliter of each library created in the same batch. However, keep in mind that there may be slight variations in final, final yields between different library prep batches. So to achieve optimal cluster density, we recommend quantifying the multiplexed library pool and this before sequencing. If we are working with the blood and saliva samples, it is not required to quantify individual libraries. However, because of the viable nature of those samples, we may still want to quantify each individual library before pulling, before, like just to have an improved confidence in this case. Now that we have prepared our libraries, check them to see if the sizes are as expected and that the normalized, uh, and, and we have normalized the library concentrations too, we can move on to sequencing. Here is a table which lists the recommended library loading concentrations on different Illumina sequencing instruments. This table can be found in the reference guide too. Please keep in mind that these loading concentrations are a good place to start with but some minor adjustments may need to be made based on the small differences in pipetting or techniques between labs or differences in library sizes from what is expected. If you would like to see 
what an expected Illumina DNA prep sequencing run should look like. We do have a number of public data sets available in BaseBase Sequence Hub. After you log in into BaseBase, you will select the Demo Data tab as shown on the upper right side of the screen and search for Illumina DNA prep in this case. We have examples of run with small genomes like bacteria or larger genomes like human. We also have a range of different instruments examples. If you do have any questions about these sample data sets, don't hesitate to reach out to us in tech support. Lastly, I would like to discuss the optional blood and saliva and even bacteria workflow in more details. For the blood and saliva workflows, some additional equipment may be needed, as I discussed before, because these samples are potential biohazards. We will need a biosafety level two lab or cabinet with a working hood. Also, we will need a BSL-2 thermocycler for the lysis incubation, as well, as well as a BSL-2 incubator that is capable of holding temperature of 50 degrees Celsius, as well as the ability to hold origin DNA collection tubes. If working with blood and dried blood spots, we will need to purchase the Flex Lysis Reagent Kit, which is sold separately. This is both for liquid blood and for dried blood spots, for which we have a demonstrated protocol linked here. With these blood protocols, we want to use proper PPE, since these samples are potential biohazards. The blood needs to be collected in specific tubes, and we want to make sure we are filling with the appropriate volume. The blood tubes should be shipped and stored at 4 degrees Celsius and processed within three days of sample collection. When working with this type of sample, ensure that we invert to mix the EDTA blood collection tube before adding the blood sample to the plate. The lysis protocol involves uh, using the magnetic stand with the sample purification purification beads as mentioned before. Please note that the beads and the blood have a similar color. So we will not see a clear sample as we normally would when incubating the magnetic beads on the stand. Because of this, we need to be careful when pipetting. And this to ensure that we do not disturb the pellet when removing the supernatant, of course. On this picture, you can see the white arrow point, pointing to the bead pellet, which has the DNA in this case. If we pipette the magnetic beads by accident, we would just need to put the whole sample back, back on the magnetic stand and allow for beads to form a pellet again. There is no need to purchase additional sample purification beads or SPBs with this protocol because the SPBs are provided in sufficient quantities with the Illumina DNA prep reagents. If we are using the saliva extraction protocol, we will need to specifically purchase the origin DNA saliva collection tubes with the catalog numbers shown on the top right of the slide. After collection, Saliva is mixed with the Origin DX solution contained in the collection tube. After this, we will do a heat treatment to lyse the cells by incubating the tubes for at least one hour at 50 degrees Celsius using the BSL-2 incubator mentioned earlier. This protocol is expected to generate at least 100 nanograms of DNA which is why when we use the saliva lysis protocol in the supplemental procedures, we do expect a normalized library yield. One last thing I would like to show you is this demonstrated protocol for direct bacterial colony sequencing, 
With this protocol, there is no need to do a liquid culture followed by DNA extraction. We can just take half of a 10 microliters loop bit with beads before spinning down and perform a bead cleanup. After this protocol, we will just use 10 microliters of this extracted DNA going into the Illumina DNA prep protocol. On the bottom of this slide is a figure that shows different types of bacteria on the x-axis, and we can see the amount of DNA extracted in the 10 microliters lysate with different types of samples. With these different microbial species, we can see with the gray line that we have more than 100 nanograms DNA in the 10 microliter lysate going into the Illumina DNA prep protocol. The link to the demonstrated protocol and data sheet can be found on the bottom of this slide. To finish up, I would like to share with you some additional resources for the Illumina DNA prep workflow. The Illumina DNA prep data sheet includes many of the figures used to explain the library prep workflow, and it provides comparison with the other Nextera kits. We also have a link to the Illumina DNA prep support page where we can find extensive support documents, including the ref guide, as well as the demonstrated protocols for dried blood spots and microbial colony extraction. Additionally, we have a link to our Illumina adapter sequences document, which has our index sequences. The index adapters pooling guide provides guidelines to help you choose color balanced index combinations for low plexity library pools. We also have a library prep training video, which goes over the protocol and best practices for Illumina DNA prep. And of course, at the bottom of this slide, we have a link to our base space public data sets as well. Finally, I would like to thank you all for joining our webinar today. I hope this has provided useful information for you as you get started with our Illumina DNA prep kit.